Thank you very much for the introduction, Maya, and welcome to our talk, Visualizing Cultural Heritage, Visual Approaches to Modeling and Representing Multimodal Data. Let's get right to it. Um, here you can see our team of the UC lab at the University of Applied Science. Um, we are an interdisciplinary group of researchers, which uh, we have one topic in common, which is visualization. And um, as you can see, um, we follow this uh, approach from different angles. Um, data visualization is our main topic, I would say, but um, we also follow the cultural heritage data in that context and network visualization. And also our research project in particular links to the digital humanities, I would say. But we also have other projects which, which deal more with uh, like climate change data, geo visualization, and also critique and theory uh, in terms of visualization. So just to give you an idea of our research group. Our um, research project, Restaging Fashion, um, here you can see our project members, uh, our project head, Professor Mar Marianne Dirk, which is a professor for information visualization. And as you can see, the team is quite interdisciplinary. Also, we have an art historian, uh, Sabine, which is not with us today. And uh, the both of us um, meet more from the cultural science or information science uh, area, and Giacomo here from uh, the information uh, visualization research area. Um, the Restaging Fashion Project is about uh, digitization and visualization. We also digitize by ourselves as uh, sources. Um, first of all, we are depending on a database which already has over 600 digitized uh, paintings and miniatures from the 15th to the 19th century. It's a part of the Lipperheide um, collection in Berlin in the State Museum. Um, it's uh, relevant to know that uh, it's not about uh, the, con the paintings or miniatures itself. So the research or the collection is about the dresses which are depicted in the paintings. So the overall uh, research topic from the art historian side is uh, dress image research. Also, we are um, right now um, digitizing prints and drawings, which are semantically uh, related to the dresses um, in the paintings. Also, we have uh, textual sources. We are right now, as I mentioned earlier, um, doing the modeling of the textual sources in our project. And then um, maybe the most uh, interesting or innovative part, we are 3D scanning actually garments and accessoires from the German um, National Museum in Nuremberg, uh, which is also a work in progress. We already um, scanned, I would say, seven objects. And then the result of the digitization is actually multimodal data. Can I continue? Thank you, Linda. So I'll just give a bit of uh, an introduction to the uh, technical infrastructure that we use. So we. Uh, mainly use OmekaS as a knowledge organization system, which is a web publication uh, tool used by libraries, museums, and institutions. And uh, uh, it allows us to describe our items using the, the standards of the semantic web. We can link between items, uh, use uh, pre-installed vocabularies, or import additional ones, and also uh, link to uh, external thesauri. As we can see here, we have a detailed view of, um, of an item, which we uh, described using a CDOC CRM. And uh, in this case, we had to extend a little bit the interface in OmekaS to allow um, the nested structure of uh, CDOC CRM to, uh, to properly work within, as usually uh, Omeka, uh, Omeka's properties uh, linked to are uh, referring to literal, literal or URIs. And as we can see, uh, the dimension class, for example, has quite some sub-properties. 
Um, additionally, since all of our uh, resources uh, in Omeka are represented as JSON-LD, uh, we make quite some use of the API from Omeka to visualize our collection and of observable notebooks as tool to uh, work a bit more with visualization. Um, so in this case, we can see the graph representation of every item in our collection um, by scrolling a list or by searching um, an item by its ID, we can see its, uh, its graph. And we mainly use a tool like this to um, have a bit of an overview of our data modeling. Then aside of um, the collection, we also created uh, different notebooks to have an overview of the data schema that we are using. And uh, as we can see in this case, we have all the hierarchies of the classes of CDOC uh, CRM, starting from the E1 entity on the left. And by selecting a specific uh, class, in this case, the attribute assignment, I believe, um, we can see all of the properties and the classes directly related to it. It's a formal description. The, um, in general, the classes hierarchies under which the uh, identifier assignment, uh, assignment falls within. And in general, all of the properties that are inherited and then can be connected to such class. And we um, created this kind of uh, notebook also to have a bit of a, of a general overview of uh, CDOC uh, ourselves and to uh, facilitate our data modeling. You can continue. Yeah. Here we have an example of how we uh, actually are modeling the art historian discourse because uh, we figured um, it's like an yeah, like a philo philosophical reasoning kind of uh, work to do in a way, um, because that structure of CDOC CIM gives you the chance to really model the discourse of a certain object or the history of um, a scientific discourse regarding a certain object. Um, so to just give you like some examples in particular of art historian discourse, because uh, that's the main topic of our research project. Um, first of all, you you can uh, see the proven provenance uh, research. It was also mentioned earlier in the um, project from uh, Tokyo that this is a very relevant uh, topic in art historian discourse. Who um, did the acquisition and uh, who was the object brought to? Also another topic which is quite highly relevant to art historian discourse is the restoration of an object. So we use uh, the E11 modification um, event for that and uh, it's really a nice structure to express actually uh, which materials were involved in the restoration, when did it happen and uh, what was the result or in which way the object uh, really changed. So, and to give you a third example of the art historian discourse, um, the attribute assignment, which is a really important one, um, because imagine someone would say, ah, the painting is not from Raphael at all, so it would be a groundbreaking research thing. And uh, the uh, event of attribute assignment would be a possibility to express that kind of events uh, within the discourse um, in CDOC CIM. And uh, we use, uh, in this case, uh, the identifier assignment, the E15 um, entity, to express uh, that kind of events. Also, we uh, want to show you uh, some of our paintings, uh, not only speaking like in a very abstract way about the objects. Um, here we have a portrait of Virginia Guccina at the age of 20. and. Um, this is to give you an example how um, important it is to um, model the inscriptions because in that case you can see um, the um, Virginia is holding a little notebook in her hands and if you go in detail you would see that uh, it has an inscription and the inscription has a symbolic content and uh, the content actually uh, gives uh, the ide identification of the person so it stated the name there. there. So therefore you would know um, who that lady is in the painting. Also, we um, decided to model in which position uh, the inscriptions are. In this case, we uh, only use uh, the P3 class has a node, and uh, then we say it's in the front of the picture, built verso. Um, another example would be sometimes the inscriptions 
are on the back or even on the frame and we also decided to give the frame an additional object so we have the human made object the main painting and then you, we have the frame as a physical thing um, also referring to the main object and just quickly uh, one other um, nice a miniature of our collection. It's also a portrait of a woman showing a specific dress, which is uh, quite common in the south part of Germany, I would say. <laughs> I'm not an expert there. And here we have the event of acquisition. So the acquisition has type and it has a time span. Um, but the other one is maybe a bit more controversial or crucial for our um, data basis because um, we have actually sometimes two production events. Um, the first event, E12 production, which you can see here in the middle part, refers actually to the dress which is depicted on the uh, miniature in this case. And, um, so the dress is dated within the time span be between the 1750s and 849. And on the other hand, you have uh, the production date of the painting, which is the second production event we are linking here. So And it gives slightly another production event. So you can also check by that um, production event time spans uh, if it's accurate so it's uh, if it's really possible that it shows that kind of dress and whether it's uh, in that exact same time span or not so it's also um, kind of a reflection on the um, art historian discourse in that way so Giacomo I hand Thank over you. Well, I need this. <laughs> okay so um Aside structuring visualization, as we showed before to, let's say, double check on the modeling, we also want to have um, an overview on the data entry that we're doing. So going back at the previous uh, example mentioned by Linda, here we have a timeline of the different types of dates that we have in, in our collection, which are based on um, the date in which the garment was, uh, was made, uh, the actual date of the painting, if we would know, or by the uh, time span of the person that lived and that is depicted in the in the painting. We can uh, have m multiple uh, views uh, of the timeline, browsing, uh, changing between these three modes, uh, and um, yeah, that gives uh, an overview on uh, finding, for example, inconsistencies in uh, in dates. Additionally, since we use different classification systems such as Icon Class or AAT. We also have structured some uh, uh, visualization tools to uh, to show such st uh, structure. In this case, we can see um, the icon class structure that we are using in uh, in, uh, in Refa. And uh, on the left, we have uh, um, the hierarchies of uh, uh, alpha, the it's alphanumerical hierarchies. And by clicking on a specific, let's say, uh, level of the graph, we can extend it. See the labels which are uh, connected to, to such property or which describe such property and all of the items that are um, falling under that category and also this kind of approach gives a little bit of, a, of an overview of the amount of items that are described using a, um, a specific uh, label and to find in case uh, mismatches. Then except of these two examples and the previous one that we showed earlier um, we would have more visualization, for example, focusing on uh, the different sizes of the objects that we have, from the large paintings to the small miniatures, for example. Um, the distinction between the, the front of the painting and, um, and the backs, uh, and uh, in general visual similarities to, uh, within the collection and so on. But instead maybe of going in depth uh, in such example where you a bit understood the, um, how we use visualization in the project, we wanted to quickly give an introduction to another project that uh, that's in our lab and um, so if in a restaging fashion we use kind of visualization to enhance the the modeling and the data inputting in um, in the amazonia future lab fidel tomet our colleague has more of let's say a visual driven approach on uh, on the data inputting and uh, um, this project mainly deals with uh, linking different collections metadata from uh, yeah, different institution and describing more 
uh, non-tangible processes. For example, in this case, we can see a canvas of linked items which uh, are describing the production of manioc in the upper Rio Negro in Brazil, and uh, where every node uh, specifically um, refers to a specific event. Um, in this case, we built uh, uh, together a um, custom front-end uh, on, on a graph database called Terminus uh, DB, where we can use uh, uh, drag-and-drop features to link and describe uh, uh, such specific events. So in a way, we use visualization more uh, actively connected to the modeling, but more in a uh, small scale uh, um, yeah, kind of uh, setup. You want? Okay, um, just to um, give a short conclusion, uh, maybe you got a, a glimpse of uh, what you can do with uh, visualization. Um, first of all, we used um, visualization to uh, present multimodal sources and multimodal data, because it's not only that uh, um, different physical um, materialities, there's also uh, different formats. If, if you think of the 3D data, it's a totally different thing than maybe um, um, an image file or something. So uh, we use visualization for presenting in a digital environment, in an interface, uh, all those different kinds of um, sources and materials and um, equally we uh, use visualization to do some graph representations of our collection. Um, Giacomo was mentioning uh, different dimensions like uh, the factor of time, doing timelines or the dimensions of the um, paintings in comparison all group but um, in certain or different types of similarity. Um, then we use visualization also to uh, model the scientific um, discourse because um, at this point if you link an entity with a property to another entity you already have a kind of an iconicity or imagery because there is a spatial relation uh, founded and so it's uh, already a visual thing to do so to speak to model and to relate entities with each, each other and uh, in the best case scenario, you have a really uh, dense semantic uh, contextualization of all the objects, which might uh, present the back uh, image here a bit. And um, the semantic contextualization of data could lead to um, new research uh, results. So uh, in general, we could say that we use visualization very um, as an epistemic tool in order to gain new knowledge and new on information on specific collections, but also um, on the methods and on the process of reasoning within a specific um, discipline. So now we are looking forward to your questions and uh, thank you all for listening. Thank you. Uh, there are questions, and do we have a microphone? Is it Stephen there? Good. Go ahead. Hi. Um, very nice. Thank you uh, for presenting uh, some nice visualizations of CRM things. I was wondering if you had looked at using CRM inf for your uh, visualizations of uh, the discourse around objects? That was the first question. I have three or four. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so what exactly was the question if we... Uh, have you looked at using CRM inf to visualize the... Ah, yeah. Yeah, uh, we were talking about that. I mean, we always uh, struggle a bit uh, between... Theoretically, you could model everything in a very detailed manner, but also we have to... Um, be a bit careful with our time and resources um, and we have uh, on a very regular basis uh, discussions um, also with the art historian because she really wants to uh, model everything in depth but uh, sometimes we have to ask ourselves okay how many persons would uh, approach or ask that question regarding the data? For instance, is uh, the print or the drawing in a specific uh, part of a desk within the museum? Uh, would someone be interested in that? I mean, you can model it and 
and you could publish it, but is it a useful information? And um, with the textual sources, we are also a bit, um, yeah, going in more the pragmatic way right now, and just li linking the document for now, and that's it. But we are also thinking of um, using uh, like BibTag and the Bibo format to um, really refer to the specific. Um, um, pages or images within the documents. That's more like our struggle or question at the moment. So, yeah. But uh, that inf came up uh, and also to use uh, fiber um, to integrate the bibliographic yeah, the LRM, um, yeah. information. Um, yeah. <clears throat> the, the, the second thing I was wondering was um, when you're looking at timelines and you're trying to reconstruct uh, whether you have uh, misconceptions in dating. Have you thought about using Bayesian statistics? Uh, there's some really nice stuff done in archaeology looking at using um, archaeological context data and uh, carbon-14 dating to produce very accurate curves. Yeah, I think in general, if I can answer to that, um, I guess uh, the topic of timeline and time in general is quite uh, uh, a big discussion in our lab in general, uh, but mainly instead of uh, uh, building the perfect timeline time or have uh, specific dates, in, uh, it's more on, uh, let's say, also what we would have to focus uh, next uh, in, uh, in, the, in the date modeling is how to deal with uncertainties and define the range of uncertainties and the, the size of the, let's say, the time span that could be uncertain. So I would say that... Uh, uh, May, maybe yeah, the the design of the timeline and the structure of it uh, is not the main uh, focus so far, but just into uh, having a basic visualization of the times that we have and how to uh, describe better and, uh, and go in the direction of, let's say, modeling the uh, uncertainties in time. Yeah, and also I think in the end we really have to think about uh which what uh, events we want to contextualize our data. So that would be a good uh, advice here. Um, but it's like a customized or um, made from scratch visualization. So we won't uh, use any other tools uh, for the timelines. But we really have to think about uh, if we want to put like certain uh, events in world history, for instance, to can contextualize our specific uh, data. That would be an open question, more like for the um, yeah, last project year, which is next year, when we um, come to a result and show our prototypes and everything. But thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else who would like to ask a question? Thank you, Stephen, for your questions. Somebody here on site? I had a couple of questions for you, but uh, Stephen pitched in and also you already answered how this is going to go on. So I think that we are going to thank you and hope that you will have good discussions here in the conference and continue with the good work. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you.